Well, hello everyone. I'm very excited that I'm finally producing another practice vlog for you. I know it's been quite a while, but I'm very happy that I'm preparing for a new series of recitals and recordings. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking specifically about Beethoven's Sonata No. 4 in E flat major. It's a piece that's very special to me personally, one that I actually played over a decade ago when I was starting my undergrad degree. I played this as part of my junior recital. And I think it's one of Beethoven's more neglected works. As always, a big, huge shout out to my patrons who have been supporting me through this process. If you want to go ahead and follow me on Patreon and get access to bonus material, I have my PDF of the Rachmaninoff first movement of his third concerto for solo piano that is finished and completed. I'm going to be begin practicing that in preparation for recitals and recordings. A lot of that's on Patreon as well as other bonus content. So the fourth sonata, this is Opus 7 in E flat major. It's also nicknamed the Grand Sonata, partly because of its scale. It's uh, really, I think, Beethoven's first early attempt, at least in the piano world, of creating a large scale work that broke the mold of that traditional classical sonata carried to us from people like Haydn and Mozart. Uh, it's really structured more like a little mini symphony for the piano. I say mini, it's actually in its full performance with all the repeats taken, usually over half an hour long. The only longer sonata would be the Hammerklavier Sonata, which came place uh, far later in his career and was again written like a more like a full-scale symphony when it comes to the Hammerklavier. A lot of composers have certain associations with key centers, and Beethoven is no exception. So this sonata being in the key of E flat major shares the same key as the Eroica symphony or the Heroic symphony and the Emperor concerto. So E flat for Beethoven is a very heroic, majestic, uh, kind of more extroverted type of piece. And it also happens to be the relative major of C minor, which is his fifth symphony, his pathetique sonata. It's a key that's more turbulent and stormy. So you get to see the juxtaposition of E flat major with certain C minor characteristics. It's also interesting that the second movement is in a actually somewhat distantly related key. Uh, we would call this a thirds relationship of C major. Now, Beethoven started doing this, and people like Schubert loved to put keys in thirds apart, so a minor third apart or a major third apart. And you see this amazing slow movement, which we'll talk about. Then you have the third movement, which consists of a trio, an allegro in three, and a minore section, which is in the key of E flat minor, one that you don't see too often. Uh, finally returning to E flat major for the final and fourth movement rondo. Now I'd like to focus a little bit on the second movement, Largo con gran expressione. Largo, very slow with huge and expansive expression. I think this is one of the most beautiful slow movements of Beethoven, particularly from his early years. And it's just this magical moment. One of the things I love about Beethoven is he takes a very simple theme and he makes it profound through the way that he structures it. Essentially, we're going one, five, five, one. Now we have a secondary dominant, five of five, two, the five of one. But listen to the way. hangs onto these suspensions here.
this lovely A. That A is still there. So the inner lines are of particular interest. repeats this line second time reaches even higher and then only to come back to the first theme but now it's pianissimo Forzando means reinforced. We have, uh, again, extremes, very, very common in Beethoven, pianissimo to fortissimo, and you don't want to give this away. So we have the traditional diminished seventh chord, which is a very ambiguous chord within classical music. It could go multiple different ways. In this case, it sets up this minor section, all orchestra. an A flat major. So a lot of stuff is happening here. Notice how Beethoven is so specific in his use of rests and silences. Uh, to him, the silence is just as important as the actual music, that room to breathe, because it increases the anticipation of not knowing what's next. Couple that with a direct modulation into A flat major. here of course pizzicatos in the basses and cellos um, maybe some horns and woodwinds and look at the way he exits this a flat major section again directly back into c major so now we have double dotted eighth notes with 32nd notes very particular very precise precision is key when you're when you're dealing with beethoven Beethoven asks the pianist to do something that is impossible. 
he wants you to crescendo on a single note. From this G to this A flat. Now the best that we can do uh, is sort of imagine this sound and if you could see me from the side, my entire body is moving forward into this A flat so that the listener kind of gets a sense of what is to come. You've got this lone flute at the top there after this very heavy string section here. love this. Isn't that great? Finally, we're here back at the recap. So, um, another subito moment here. Very rhythmic. So if you want to be able to play these double dotted notes effectively, you have to subdivide into eight uh, because you have to be hearing that. Um, and then, very, very long descent. Beethoven loved extremes. Uh, you see it again here. Very stratified from low to high. Uh, in fact, it's largely because of Beethoven that the piano continued to develop into the 88 keys that we have today. In his piano, he would have been playing at the very extremes. Um, and towards the, uh, over the course of his life, he continued to push further and further um, and he met with piano makers who would develop new instruments. He was always very excited when he got new range, so pay close attention to that when you're playing Beethoven. Now the recapitulation of the second movement has a couple interesting things. Starts off very similar. Accenting this A flat, just a little bit more dissonant than before.
coda or an ending because at this point he could have really ended the piece. That is the end of the thematic material, but Beethoven, being himself, loves codas. Um, Mozart had codas, Haydn had codas, Beethoven's tend to be much more expansive, uh, sort of like writing a letter and then writing PS and then going, going on and continuing or having an epilogue after the end of a novel. so it all goes to this G chord. Our target is C. So we're, we're hanging out on the dominant right now. And surely we'll end? No. Here's the end. No. One more statement of the theme. So with all of these changes, it just keeps you guessing, and yet he somehow manages to find a way to add new material, new notes, adding a particular voicing to a chord or a certain harmony that makes it stand out, keeps it interesting throughout. Always these change in texture, these sudden dynamic shifts, um, which are just some of the key components of Beethoven and one reason why I love this piece so much. All right, so there's my introduction to Beethoven's fourth sonata particularly the second movement i hope you guys enjoyed it found it entertaining and hopefully interesting as well as informative uh, let me know if you guys have any questions don't forget to check out my other social media it's linked below as well as my patreon i'm going to have a full recording of this piece for my patreon members only so you can check that out as well thank you guys i will see you in the next video